Chapter 1 It was very stuffy and hot where I crouched, crouched and the straw tickled my legs. There was hardly any light either, but I could see the bird on her nest of straw. She was about five feet away from me on the far side of the chicken house and she had no idea I was there. If I moved I would spoil everything. So I stayed quite still. So did the chicken. Presently, very slowly, she raised herself from the straw. She was facing away from me and bending forward. I saw a round white object gradually protruding from the features between her legs. It got bigger. Suddenly she gave a little wiggle and plop it landed on the straw. I had actually watched the laying of an egg. With loud pleased clucks the chicken shook her feathers, moved the egg with her beak, then prudently strutted her way out of the hen house. I tumbled out, stiff but excited, and ran all the way to the house. My mother was just about to call the police. She'd been searching for me for hours. She had no idea that I'd been crouched all that time in the hen house. This was my first serious observation of animal behavior. Behavior. I was five years old. How lucky it was that I had an understanding mother. Instead of being angry because I had given her a scare, she wanted to know all about the wonderful thing I had just seen. Even though I was so young at the time, I can still remember a lot about that experience. I remember being puzzled about eggs. Where on a chicken was there an opening big enough for an egg to come out? I don't know if I asked anyone. If I did, no one told me. I decided to find out for myself. I remember thinking as I watched the hen going into one of the hen houses. Ah, now I'll follow her and see what happens. And I remember how she rushed out, squawking in alarm when I squeezed in after her. Obviously, that was no good. I would have to get in first and wait until a hen decided to come in and lay her egg. That is why I was so long inside the hen house. You have to be patient if you want to learn about animals. When I grew up, I became an etologist, a long word that simply means a scientist who studies animal be behavior. Most people, when they think of an animal, think of a crea creature with hair 
such as dog or cat, a rabbit or a mouse, horse or a cow. In fact, the word animal includes all living creatures except for plants, jellyfish and insects, frogs and lizards, fish and birds are all animals, but as cats and dogs are. But cats and dogs and horses are mammals, a special kind of animal. Humans are mammals too. You probably know all that. Children today know a lot more about these sorts of things than most adults did when I was your age. I remember having a huge argument with one of my aunts when I tried to make her believe that the whole was a mammal, not a fish. She wouldn't believe me and cried. I was so frustrated. The first person to be person to be known as an etologist was an Austrian, Conrad Lorenz. He's often called the father of etology. Etology. He always loved animals of all kinds. And uh, in addition to the dogs he kept as pets, he lived with all kinds of wild animals in his home near Vienna. Most of these animals were perfectly free to come and go as, mm -hmm. they, as they pleased. Conrad Lorenz is best known for his work with the grey leg geese. He began raising and studying them in 1935 and he continued to observe them into his 80s. Conrad Lorenz found that adult male and female geese are very faithful to each other. They fall in love, marry and stay together until one of them dies. Then the one who is left does not marry again. If its mother is still alive, it goes back to her. Conrad Lorenz has been mother to many geese. Those he raised from the time they left their eggs when they became adult, these geese left him and flew off with wild geese. But if they lost their mates, they came back to Lawrence. He found that baby geese, when they hatch from their legs, learn to follow the first moving object they see. Usually, this is the mother goose. But when Lawrence raised geese, they followed him in a step. Then he discovered that, that if he hatched mallard duck eggs, the ducklings refused to follow him. But if the eggs were hatched by a domest domestic duck, they followed her at once. What did the domestic do the, the, that he, Lawrence, didn't? She quaked. And uh, her quaking sounded just like the quaking of a mallard duck. Ah, thought Lawrence, that's the secret. But scientists must always make tests. So when the next uh, lot of little ducklings hatched, Lawrence bent over them, quacked 
and gradu gradually moved away. They followed him. But it was very exhausting for him, taking his baby ducklings for a walk. If he stood up, towering high above them, or if stopped quacking for more than a moment, they stopped following and began to cry loudly. One day, when Lawrence was walking the ducklings, something made him look up. Peering over the tall wall around the meadow were some of the village people. They were staring in hor horror at the professor who, as far as they could see, was quacking away to himself while creeping along the ground in a most peculiar way. The ducklings were completely hidden in the long grass. No wonder the local people began to think the professor was crazy. Conrad Lawrence with his ducks. UPI Batman news photos. Ethologists are interested in how animals live their lives and why they behave the way they do. They are always asking questions. Why does a dog go round and round in a circle before it lies on its bed? How does a male moth find his female even if she is miles away, and so on. Some ethologists go on and on asking questions about one particular kind of animal. Karl von Frisch, a German, was fascinated by honey bees. How did a worker bee returning to her hive after collecting ho honey Tell the other worker bees where to go, they could find her honey patch even if she herself didn't return. He found out that the returning bee performs a wonderful waggle dance that tells the others exactly where to go. She gives signals with her legs her wings and her tail. Then Frisch wanted to know whether she could see the beautiful colors of the flowers. flowers. How good was her, her sense of smell? The more answers he found, the more questions he asked. Other et it, it, uh, Ethologists ethologist, are interested in a particular kind of behavi behavior, such as the migration of birds, or the different ways that juicy, nice tasting insects mimic poisonous ones so they won't be eaten or the food-bearing behavior of rats and mice. All it ethologists ask questions. How? Why? What for? Ethologists do their studying in different ways. Lawrence, as I said, took the animals he wanted to observe home with him. He had a very long suffering wife. Others, like Nico Timbergen, another very famous early ethologist, do experiments out in the place where the animals live. 
Tim Bergen is best known for his work with different kinds of seagulls. He used to go out to the cliffs and rocky ledges where they breed. He spent a lot, lot of time just watching them and writing down all the different things they did. But he also experimented. He had learned some of the most extraordinary things. Some ghouls, for example, become really excited if they see a giant egg. If Timbergen placed such a monster near the nest of a herring ghoul or an oyster catcher, she would leave her oven egg and desperately but hopelessly try to clamber onto the monstrous, monstrous fake. Then there are other ethologists who also go to the home of the animals they wish to study, but do not do experiments. They just watch, wait for things to happen, and record what they hear and see. That is what I do. I began living among the studying the chimpanzees in Tanzania. It was Tanganyika when I began, in 1960. I am still studying them today with the help of students and Tanzanian field staff. It took me a long time before I could get close enough to the chimps to make good observations. It took even longer before I could get close enough to the chimps to make good observations. At first they were very shy. It took even longer before I understood their language of calls and gestures and the way they live in their society. But it was worth it because apart from the human animal, the chimpanzee is the most fascinating animal of all. At least, that is what I think. How on earth, you may wonder, did I get started? Well, I'll tell you.